Antonio starts right now. Hey there, good morning. It is Wednesday. It is March 18th, and she's still way over there. I know. I still love you. It's distant, but know. you know, it's we're doing what we have to do. We are doing what we have to do. A couple things right off the top. We got an interesting tweet from the president a short time ago. I mean, just minutes ago. Just happening. Yeah, the president tweeted, we will be by mutual consent temporarily closing our northern border with Canada to not essential traffic. Trade will not be affected. Rather, details to follow. Also, a bit of housekeeping are on the earlier edition of GMSA. We talked to Mike Osterhage via Skype. He is not here with us anymore. He and his family are well, in Well, he's not here with us for two weeks. Right, right. <laughs> I don't want right. to start more rumors. Yeah. Boy, boy, I made that worse, didn't I? Uh, <laughs> oh, everybody's laughing now. No, Mike's fine. He and his family are fine. He's in self-quarantine. We just want to let you know he's okay. He doesn't have anything, no symptoms, no nothing. There just may have been a possible yes. exposure uh, with his son. His son went on a spring break with a family, right. and one person in that family tested positive. And because his child was around him, they're self-quarantining for 14 days. No one in the family has tested positive for it, so he right. does not have it. He is just quarantining as a precautionary measure, like they're asking people to do. So he's healthy. He's healthy. He's happy. He's he's just fine. Okay. So so there, and so there. he's gonna be back in two weeks. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Mark. Let's move on now. Okay, so Mike, if you're <laughs> sorry, oh, he's not with us anyway. He's very with us, just at what? home. Oh, I've got the wrong story. All right, stuff, more stuff to do. Stuff that Mike, you, if you're watching right now, and your family, and anyone else who is home with their kiddos and looking right. for ways to travel because you're stuck inside, you can travel virtually. Virtual field trips, all right? So here's uh, several of them, and you can wind up just Google virtual field trips. Probably mm -hmm. easy way to do this. Google Earth has put together Discover Hawaii, featuring Ooh. states tropical islands from the black lava rock cliffs to its lush rainforests and volcanoes. I feel like we're describing a fiesta float. How about this one? <laughs> It does kind of sound like that. Right. Yellowstone National Park has virtual tours of its most visited and hard to reach features, including Fountain Paint Pot, Mammoth Hot Springs, the Grand Canyon of Yellowstone, Mud Volcano, and Norris Geyser Basin. She just wanted to say Paint Pot. Oh, there's also uh, yeah, Virtual Yosemite. Mm -hmm. There is uh -huh. Virtual Yosemite. Where are you right now? Oh, I'm now that's... jumped down below the picture talking about the live cams as well. Oh, you could also take the kids to the zoo virtually. Yes. Yeah, so you there's... can visit some of the most fabulous um, animal displays. She's not wrong. Uh, there's this, the live cams at the San Diego Zoo, Monterey Bay Aquarium, Georgia Aquarium. They are up and running. Yes, and you can do museum collections, and you can even go to the Louvre. And it, it, there's so many places all across the entire globe that you can visit virtually. And a Great Wall of China, ready to virtually explore. And finally, Access Mars, if you're just tired of this planet altogether. <laughs> Access Mars allows for a 360-degree view of the surface recorded by NASA's Curiosity rover. Promises to be out of this world. Let's take a look at your rundown. President Trump is urging Congress to inject up to a trillion dollars into the economy to fight novel coronavirus. We're going big. Americans need cash now, and the president wants to get cash now. And I mean now in the next two weeks. Hospitals across the country are bracing for a shortage of beds and ventilators. Right now, they have about 62,000 ventilators, and there's another 20,000 in a federal stockpile. To provide more room for hospital beds, New York's governor says college dorms and senior housing facilities are possible options. Options. Many states are also looking at hotels. We are waiting to learn more about the second death in Texas from coronavirus. We know the person died in Tarrant County, which is Fort Worth, Arlington area. Officials have also said the person was a senior. U.S. officials are warning about a series of cyber attacks. Officials say foreign actors are spreading disinformation about the coronavirus and have even tried to slow down computers at the Department of Health and Human Services. Despite the coronavirus, voters still turned out on Election Day in three states to give Joe Biden more wins. The former Vice President swept Tuesday's primaries, winning in Florida, Arizona, and Illinois. A driver in the hospital after police say he crashed right in front of UT Health Science Center, taking out two utility poles. Happened around 11:30 last night near Babcock and Louis Pasteur. Working from home may be the new normal for busy parents, but their stir-crazy kids aren't happy about being pent up all day. Luckily, there are tons of online resources to keep your kids busy and learning. One of New York's busiest streets was nearly deserted on St. Patrick's Day. No one was around except well this man but he wasn't the only st patrick's day die hard in dublin st patrick himself took to the streets trying to chase the coronavirus out of ireland nothing says i love you like a dozen roses but during the coronavirus scare there's something your sweetie might want even more instead of a dozen roses they created a unique bouquet of toilet paper <laughs> 
Well, that's one way to be creative. By the way, Mike is watching from home. Hi, Mike. Mike he's, yes. Again, he's good. What did he say? He's News good. of my death has been greatly exaggerated. Well, we're glad you're in good spirits, buddy. Oh, you just got to smile through some of this, don't you? 903 right now. Let's go outside with live cam. On our uh, commute in very early this morning, we had... Go rain. say it. What? Mike's favorite saying. Rain. Oh, spits and drizzles? Oh, I spits knew you'd say it. Nah. Yeah. In honor of Mike, we'll talk about spits and drizzles. There was a little <laughs> bit out there this morning. Uh, some light rain that moved into San Antonio dissipated rather quickly. We may get a similar setup tonight, so there are some more chances for rain, and we've got a pretty good shot coming up on Friday, too. Right now, though, warm and humid. 71 degrees at the airport, 69 Hondo, 65 in Kerrville, and we'll be up around 81 degrees today. Sound familiar? Because that's about where we were yesterday. There is an outside chance for shower this afternoon, but uh, most of us are going to stay dry again until tonight. Let's take a look at the pollen count. Oaks in the high category, no surprise, but it is down a little bit from where it was yesterday. Mold is moderate. Hackberry, mulberry, both low. Here's a look at the last 12 hours. We had those showers and storms out west look promising. Did bring some decent rain to parts of South Texas, just not here in San Antonio. We picked up a hundredth, of, picked up a hundredth of an inch rain. That's it. So things have cleared out now. We'll see temperatures up around 81. As we mentioned, just a 20% chance there. Uh, we have the chance tonight. We have some more chances Thursday and then into Friday and Saturday too. So it's an active pattern. We're going to talk about that seven day forecast here in just a few minutes. Guys. Thank you, sir. Right now, traffic's looking great all around town. There's 281 right there by UAW at uh, Hildebrand. Highway 90, 36th Street, west side, looking pretty good as well. New this morning at 9, a 59-year-old man is dead after he was hit crossing the street. It happened this morning around 6 on Enrique M. Barrera Parkway near Highway 90. Police tell us the driver did not see him in the road. Crews tried to save him, but he died at the scene. The driver did stop to, stop to help and is not facing any charges. Other top stories that we're following today, a retired assistant chief with the Converse Police Department who was killed after he was hit by a suspected drunk driver will be laid to rest this morning. Crash happened back March 10th on the 14,300 block of Nacogdoches Road. Please say 23-year-old uh, Gianna, or Gianna Nicole. Gina, maybe? Maybe Gina, Gina Nicole, Nicole Bernice Kutros, my apologies for mispronouncing, had been driving erratically before the crash. She was charged with intoxication, manslaughter, and evading arrest. The funeral service for Officer Rodney Rex Reiner is scheduled for 10 this morning at Mount Calvary Lutheran Church. It is a private ceremony, but it will be live streamed on the church's website. Just a few minutes, we'll learn how the county is changing operating procedures due to the coronavirus. A news conference with several Bear County officials will begin at 9.30. Judge Nelson Wolf and Sheriff Javier Salazar will be among those in attendance. We'll talk about changes to reduce possible person-to-person -person transmission of the virus here in the community. They will be taking that press conference, or rather we will be taking that press conference live right here on GMSA at 9. So just stay right here. Keep it here. A second drive through testing facility for COVID-19 expected to open here in San Antonio, but officials are not yet releasing where exactly this facility will be located until it's fully functional. The new testing location will operate just like the first, which opened Friday in the medical center. Right now, drive through testing only available to first responders and healthcare workers, but officials say they're hoping to expand eligibility to include people over the age of 65 who have a fever and a doctor's recommendation. Governor Greg Abbott is holding a virtual town hall meeting Thursday night so he can speak directly to people across the state. He'll talk about the coronavirus response with uh, officials from health, education and emergency management. Of course, this is not a typical town hall because there will be no audience. It's your chance to ask the governor a question. You can submit one on social media uh, in writing or on video 20 seconds or less. Use the hashtag Ask Abbott to send your questions. Send them to us. You have until 5 o'clock tomorrow. We're partnering with Next Star Media. Or is it 5 o'clock today? Is it 5 o'clock today? It tomorrow. is tomorrow. Okay, I just wanted to confirm that. Partnering with Next Star Media Group to broadcast this important discussion so you will be able to watch it right here on KSAT 12 and online at KSAT.com. Again, that's tomorrow from 7 to 8. You have to get your questions in. By video is what we prefer by 5 o'clock tomorrow. Just trying to give people plenty of heads up. Yes. In your morning headlines, at 9, Don Strange has a new addition to its meal deliveries. And some students in North Carolina step up to help their bus driver in a big way. But first, an investigation underway after seven people were hurt during an officer-involved shooting in Baltimore, Maryland. Our David Sears is following all those stories. He joins us in the studio with more. Good morning, David. Good morning, David. Two feel-good stories today. Good. The last one will be how you can get something 
that you cannot find in stores these days. I love that. We'll take them. Good. All right. We're going to get serious for a second, though. While the world and America deals with the coronavirus, had not stopped crime across the country. This is Crime Table, along with evidence markers in Baltimore. On an on-duty police officer witnessed a suspect open fire into a group of people. That officer then engaged the suspect with gunfire. This all happening about 6.30 in the evening last night. Police do not know yet if the officer hit anybody. They do know five people were transported to the hospital. They are in stable condition. There were also two other shooting victims that walked into the hospital. They're trying to figure out if those two were part of that group. Even though the officer took a shot at the suspect, he was still able to get away. And yes, you are looking at a bomb embedded in an old lava flow in Hawaii. That is half the bomb. The other half is actually underneath that flow. That one exploded. There's one that's about 50 feet away that hasn't exploded yet. Kawaska Sington was hiking in the lava flow when he came across the bombs. He just so happens to have served in the military dealing with explosives, so he knew it was time to get the hike out of there. I went in it, and that's when I, it really hit me. I said, oh, my God. I saw the front end of the bomb sticking out of the, the ceiling in the lava tube. The bomb was fully intact. Ooh, kind of scary. Now, you would first think that those bombs were from World War II. Not so. Singson says he thinks the bombs were actually dropped about 80 years ago. Back in December of 1935, the Army dropped 2,600-pound demolition bombs on an erupting Moana Loa. They were hoping to divert the lava flows that were moving pretty fast towards a town. The military used that strategy again in 1942. Singson says that he called the Department of Nat Land and Natural Resources and gave officials the GPS coordinates to the site. And that department headed over there with some teams, and they're working with the military to coordinate a plan to dispose of the suspected ordinance. Another coronavirus feel-good story this morning. A group of middle schoolers from North Carolina wound up their trip to Disney World just before the park closed up because of the COVID-19. Now, on the way home, the kids out found out some kind of troubling information about their two bus drivers. They hauled them to the Disney World. Now, both drivers' wives actually battling breast cancer. And with school closings, the drivers may be without a job for a while. This might be their last tip for a while. Like, they might not make a lot of money and they're going to need it. So we all kind of just got our money together that we could find. Yeah, there were 79 kids on that trip. The students collect all of the money that they had left over when they got home. Each student had about 10 to 15 bucks left. When they added it all up, they presented Ron and Rick with $750 in cash. That is beautiful. And finally, Don Strange Catering has a catchy way to wipe out the competition when it comes to delivering meals to folks. They have daily menu items you can get delivered for 49 bucks to feed a family of four. With each meal, you get a roll of toilet paper. Now, I don't know if That's that says something about the paper. meal you're ordering or not, but you know, might be a little spicier. So I don't know. I but, think it has nothing to do know, with that. I think it's a play just, on the fact that you can't find toilet paper in the so. stores. But then where did they get all the toilet paper? Well, you know, I saw online that several businesses are posting they're going into their company bathrooms and yeah. their bowls are empty because yeah. people are customers are coming in stealing from <laughs> yeah from right businesses off the uh, roll off the in roll. some cases yeah it's, remember it's during crazy. the hurricane a few years ago it was gas yep and now coronavirus it's toilet paper i, I still haven't figured out why it's a strange offer but we'll take it right mm -hmm. yep i think it's clever marketing it is got us I, talking about that's it. pretty good yeah. thank yeah. you david oh, all right 9-11 right now, 71 degrees still ahead on GMSA at 9. The coronavirus pandemic is now affecting the Texas Department of Criminal Justice. Paul Venema joins us for a debrief on why the department is shutting down its death chamber. And we are here at the Alamo Dome, an important blood drive going on right through those doors. We are going to walk you through all the precautions in place and explain why today is so important. Let's check the markets right now. Another horrible day on uh, Wall Street. The Dow is down. It's been worse for days now, but down uh, under 1,000 points. It's down 4.42 for 1% at 20,299. Welcome back. It is now 915. The South Texas Blood and Tissue Center in the city of San Antonio are now holding a special community blood drive at the Alamo Dome this week in response to help maintain the local blood supply and to keep it from running low. Max Massey joins us live from the Alamo Dome right here in San Antonio. Max, what's going on out there this morning, sir? 
Good morning, guys. Well, this only started at 9 a.m. There's already been 30 people, and I know there's a lot of people out there wondering what precautions are in place. Well, don't worry, because there is a lot. This is the full process. Before you can even get to get checked out, the first thing you do is... Good to go. So this is really just step one and step 1A, if you will. We are joined by the CEO, Elizabeth Waltman. And so because of social distancing, we are going to keep our distance. So Elizabeth, can you kind of walk us through this whole process? Absolutely. Good morning, everyone. We're so glad that you're taking the time to learn more about how you can donate blood and save a life. So when people come to the, the Alamo Dome, before they even get here, we want them to go online or to call us to make an appointment because we're only accepting appointments today. But when you come to the Alamo Dome, the first thing we're going to do is we're going to ask you to sanitize your hands. Then we're going to take your temperature. And if you have a temperature, you need to go home and be fever free for 24 hours before you try and donate blood again. But once you come in, we sanitize your hands, we take your temperature, then you'll go in and sit down over in our waiting area. So there we have a list of everyone who has an appointment and we have you in a queue. Once your name is called, then we will ask you once again to sanitize your hands before, we go in, before you go into the interview booth. And what we want you to know is between each and every donor, we are re-sanitizing the area to make sure that anything that our donors come in contact with and our employees is reasonably sanitized for the type of event that we have today. Then once you're screened, and we will ask you all of the questions that we normally ask our blood donors to make sure that the blood supply is safe, once we ask you all of those questions, we do a mini physical, we will take your temperature once again, plus your blood pressure, your pulse, and we will check your iron to make sure that you have enough iron to donate. If all of that's clear, then we will escort you over to the phlebotomy area. And once again, we will ask you to sanitize your hands. Because, you know, we touch our face, we touch our clothes, we touch things. So then you will go over into the phlebotomy area and you will wait to go on a bed. When you wait to go on a bed and you move from the phlebotomy area onto the bed, once again we're going to ask you to sanitize your hands. We're just creatures of habit and we want to make sure that we're keeping everybody as safe as we possibly can and to reduce their, exp uh, their exposure risk. Perfect. Your donation, I think the thing that I want to, to imp I think the thing that I want to emphasize to everyone who's listening today is that the blood supply is, is it's going to be depleted if we don't do everything we can over the next few days to get as many donors as we can. Yesterday we actually collected over 600 units. That was phenomenal. But we need to do that day after day after day. That's why the Alamo Dome is so important. So thank you to everyone who's helped us be here today. Go online, make an appointment, and come donate blood. All right. Thank you so much. And coming up at 930, we are going to give you a preview of the blood donation station. And we're even going to talk to a senator who is here to donate. Mark, Leslie. Max Massey live at the Alamo Dome. Taking necessary precautions to so give blood. Okay, let's talk about our forecast now. We're still hoping for that rain sometime this weekend. And it's still looking pretty good. I mean, we got some chances here and there. We didn't get a whole lot last night. We had some showers and storms try to work towards San Antonio. Not a lot of success, though. The numbers, yeah, not too bad as you get out towards Concan and Vanderpool, about half an inch there. Pearsall, about six hundredths of an inch. Officially at the airport, just a hundredth of an inch. So we had these showers and storms get close, and then they pretty much just fell apart. We had a couple showers and thunderstorms yesterday that moved up through Seguin and Kirby. They picked up a little bit of rain there. And it's possible we could see another isolated storm or two today. Here's a look at the last 12 hours, and you can see everything that developed out west and then worked its way east and sort of fell apart as it did. And so by the time it reached San Antonio, about 2 or 3 o'clock, Everything was just sort of fizzling out. It was just a couple sprinkles around here. Now we're just left with cloudy skies. Here's a look at the time lapse. And you can see all the clouds there. 71 degrees. Dew point is at 66. Southerly winds at about 7. We've seen a few peaks of blue sky there, too. So I do think we'll see some sun today. Basically a carbon copy of yesterday. And the satellite picture shows that we already have a couple breaks out towards Hondo in the western part of Bear County here. Temperatures low 70s here around town. And as we zoom out, it's basically right around 70 in most spots with slightly cooler readings as you get up towards Fredericksburg and Kerrville. Here's the setup. We've got more energy headed our way. So got a little piece of energy down here over Mexico that's going to work in again tonight. And just like last night, I think we'll get some storms out west. Some of these will work towards our western counties overnight and then maybe eventually towards San Antonio by early tomorrow morning. So this is around five o'clock, not seeing much, 
But as we get towards midnight, look at that. Another complex of showers and storms moving in. Could see some pockets of heavier rain out west. This will fall apart as it moves towards San Antonio. Now let's zoom out and talk about Thursday. This is Thursday, 5 o'clock. We've got our funnel boundary on our doorstep. And by Friday morning, we're looking at more good chances for rain as this front comes to it. We'll also cool down quite a bit, especially as we get into the weekend. Uh, Friday evening, a lot of the rain starts to move out, but more rain kicks in on Saturday afternoon and Saturday evening. So there are some chances here for some rain. As far as severe weather goes, there's the possibility of some stronger storms this afternoon, and this has been extended a little bit further east. So Uvalde, Hondo, Kerrville, Rock Springs, Eagle Pass, we'll have to watch for some stronger storms later on tonight. San Antonio is in the marginal risk, so we'll have to look for a little bit of thunder here, possibly overnight as well. 81 degrees today, straight shower, and then tomorrow, 81. 57, though, by Friday afternoon, 60% chance of showers both Friday and Saturday, and most of the rain starts to move out of here by Sunday. Guys. Thanks. Thank you, Justin. Exactly 922, 71 degrees. Still ahead on GMSA at 9, the Texas Department of Criminal Justice is shutting down its death chamber in hopes of preventing the spread of coronavirus. Paul Venema is here to break down what it means. Coming up next. And welcome back to GMSA at 9. The coronavirus pandemic now affecting the Texas Department of Criminal Justice. The department has decided to shut down the death chamber. Now, this decision comes after a stay of execution granted by the Texas Court of Criminal Appeals. Paul Venema joins us now for a debrief of a story that he did yesterday. So is this like what's the legal precedent here? Are we are we plowing new ground? Well, not really. It has been done, but it's very, very rare. It was done during 9-11 in a particular case, and I believe there's been one or perhaps two other cases in history, but to, to, it, it's extremely rare. So, yes, we are, in effect, uh, in, into some really unfamiliar territory here. Does the court anticipate a flood of similar stays based on the Hummel case? That is probably what is going to happen. In all likelihood, it, it, it's going to set some precedent there in terms of mm -hmm. here's you did it here. And as long as so as long as this virus stays with us, there's a good chance that that uh, uh, other uh, attorneys representing uh, clients on, on death row are going to look at this and say, you know what, this probably should apply here as well. And they may not have to. You, the, it, it, we're into such gray territory right now. The the uh, uh, the, uh, the people at, at the Texas Department of Corrections may just go ahead and say, uh, until this thing clears, there's no point in even entertaining any stays. We're just going to leave it as it is. Because to, to execute somebody takes a lot of work in terms of people and equipment and just uh, the, the people involved in terms of witnesses and so forth. And it requires people working in close quarters. So in the, there's a good possibility that the stays could, could be filed. But there's another possibility that the uh, department will just say, no, we're not going to operate this until this issue is cleared up. Well, Paul, let me ask you this. In this particular case, what happened? happens when those 60 days expire. Okay, what happens next is uh, the state will have to issue what's called a death warrant, an execution warrant. Mm -hmm. So they'll have to issue an execution warrant, another execution warrant, and from the date that's issued until 90 days, that has to uh, 90 days has to pass before they can actually execute him. So he's he's picked up uh, at the very least a, another 90 days plus the 60 days. So the reality is, I guess, if you do the math, his attorneys have uh, a, a 150 days to to work up another appeal. Has his uh, has he already filed an appeal for a stay? And what was the status when the stay was granted? Well, he his lawyers had already appealed or filed an appeal for a stay when this was granted, and uh, that was in all likelihood going to be denied. It was 11th hour appeal. And the court was prepared to deny that, but took another look at that and the situation. And the Court of Criminal Appeals on its own, not on the merits of, of the appeal that the, his lawyers have filed, but the court on its own, in an abundance of, abundance of caution, the court itself issued this stay. All right, so you'll stay on top of it and you'll just keep us posted. We'll be I know. on top it's of it. We shall. We shall. Thank, Thank you, Paul, very much. Thank you, Paul. More ahead on GMSA at 9. Fair County officials are expected to hold a press conference in just a few minutes. They're going to talk about changing operational procedures amid the coronavirus pandemic. And we are going to bring it to you live as soon as it starts. All right, All right, welcome back. Yeah, happening now. Bear County leaders are talking about a change in operating procedures. It comes as everyone is working really hard to prevent the spread of the coronavirus. We told you that we were expecting a news conference, and I believe it's happening now. That's right. Let's go ahead and look in and see where things are at. Yep, looks like everybody's there. There is Bear County Judge Nelson Wolf. Well, as you know, as of yesterday, 
We've had 11 confirmed cases of coronavirus. Uh, we will begin testing today at various sites. Uh, one of the sites will be out at the Bear County uh, uh, a Center out there where we have the AT&T Center and the Coliseum. And we would expect, as these increased testing comes about, that we will have um, more people identified um, testing uh, uh, positive for coronavirus. So with that in mind, we've been working for the last week or two to strengthen our team here at Bear County and to begin a number of new initiatives uh, to be able to help people that are going to be confronted with the economic consequences of this, uh, of this disease as well as the expansion of the disease itself. Uh, I have with us today uh, Seth Mitchell. Seth, uh, where are you? Seth Mitchell uh, had worked for the county for over 21, 21 years. Uh, he was my former chief of staff. He has worked in emergency management. He was with us when we uh, responded to the Katrina affair, when we had the terrible wreck of the train on the south side and had chlorine spill. Uh, he's worked with us on a number of issues like that. So he'll be coming into my office as special assistant, and he will coordinate the activities, both internal and external, uh, with respect to coronavirus, he'll be spending his full time and effort on that. Later on this week, we'll be meeting with the 26 mayors of the suburban cities and briefing them with respect to the number of issues that we'll be taking up today and working on today. We'll also have before the court today a memorandum of understanding that the county manager has put together uh, to bring on an expert uh, with respect to uh, uh, diseases, and it is going to be Dr. Ruth Bergen. Uh, she's with the director of the Center for Medical Humanities and Ethics at the UT Health Science Center. Uh, she has an uh, expertise in, in medicine and in infectious disease. She was a leader in putting together a treatment for hepatitis C, individuals also that were co-infected with HIV. Uh, she's had numerous awards uh, for her work in and, and, and an array of different issues with respect to medicine, and she's a graduate of the Harvard, Harvard uh, School. So we're going to be having her as our expertise to help us as we develop policies that uh, would only, not only be internal, but also as well as external ones. Uh, I'll be asking the Commissioner's Court today to uh, extend uh, the emergency powers that I have as a county judge. Uh, to extend them for 30 days as this is a moving issue as we go along and policies will change and new actions will be needed to, to, to move forward. And pending that uh, uh, approval, I'll be issuing a new uh, emergency order uh, to follow up on the ones that we have done before. Uh, we have a great team here at Barrett County and it's a team effort. Uh, uh, and we have a, a, a number of steps that we're taking and been working on. And Commissioner uh, Justin Rodriguez has been working with us on a program uh, to address the small businesses. Uh, as we know, uh, the federal government will be bailing out the big guys, and that's what they're concentrating on today. Uh, we here are limited in number of things we can do. And we want to focus on the mom and pop operations. There's probably hundreds of small restaurants around the community today as well as other small businesses that are being impacted by this and having a very difficult time meeting their payroll. So uh, Commissioner Justin Rodriguez will be laying out a program that we'll bring to the Commissioner's Court and, and, and hope to get their approval. Commissioner. Thank you, Judge. <clears throat> Good morning, everybody. Thank you for, for being here. Um, initially, too, I think we ought to acknowledge and, and be mindful of the fact that we've got first responders who are doing uh, exceptional work in our community, um, our healthcare professionals, um, so we want to thank them for what they're doing in this time of, of, uh, of crisis. Um, we also know that people in the community are fearful of what comes next. Uh, we know that there are people in our community, families, small businesses that are hurting. So uh, I want to just talk briefly about what uh, our team here at Bear County has been working on. And as you know, as the judge mentioned, we are anticipating help from our federal and state partners in short order. 
Uh, the, the great thing and the beauty of working at the local level, in particular county government, is that we don't have to wait. We can act now. Um, and so what the judge alluded to is uh, a program that Bear County is working on to invest $5 million to provide interest-free loans and $250,000 in grants for small businesses in our community here in Bear County that have suffered financial losses due to COVID-19. Uh, we will be partnering with Lift Fund, um, and they are crafting the criteria and eligibility for the, the loans and grants. Uh, but we anticipate staff bringing back uh, a recommendation to us on the next commissioner's court meeting, which would be Tuesday, um, on how we de deploy these resources, get the money into the hands of small business owners. Uh, we know anecdotally, uh, we've heard from people in our community, all of us, um, that where, where revenues are down just over the past week or so, 20, 30, 40%, sometimes even more. Um, as an example, you know, we might be able to deploy a $10,000 loan to a small business to, meet their, to meet, help meet their payroll. Um, if we're able to do that, um, that's about 500 small businesses in our community that we can help. Um, as part of the criteria, again, these are zero interest loans that Lyft Fund will be administering, um, as well as a four month grace period uh, to make payments. So um, we wanna make sure that our small business community knows that we are standing with them, um, that we are partners in getting through this crisis together. Um, and so we'll be uh, deploying those resources as soon as possible. Um, in addition, I don't know if Patricia Mejia is here from the Area Foundation. Uh, we also know the importance of responding to crisis for families. Um, the Area Foundation and United Way, I know is working on a program um, called the COVID-19 Disaster Response Fund. Um, that will be used to, uh, again, help families, uh, those that are suffering uh, with their own family budgets, um, also those that are now uh, have kids at home uh, that need resources for their, for their children. Um, so we'll be partnering along with a, a number of other partners with the Area Foundation and uh, the United Way to make sure that families in need also have resources, and we'll be announcing uh, details on that shortly. So um, again, uh, as the judge mentioned, we have a great team here that has been working around the clock to make sure that um, folks in our community know that uh, as local leaders, we want to make sure that people in need uh, know there are resources, know that they have uh, a backstop, and know that we will get through this uh, together. So thank you, uh, Judge, for uh, your support. And I believe um, I'm gonna next call up our tax assessor collector, Albert Udeste, who has some announcements from his office as well. Let me just take a couple words about Albert. Uh, let me say a couple of words about Albert. Albert's really been an innovative thinker since he's come into this office. He's done everything uh, within his power and consensus with the commissioner's court uh, to help people uh, string out payments uh, when they can't pay their taxes, uh, the drive-in that he has now, which is everybody's using, and by the way, this is a very good thing to be using right now. Uh, and so he's been innovative, and so he called me this last week and has come up with another uh, terrific idea, and we support him 100%. Uh, the commissioner's court will step with him on this. And so, Albert, please tell him what you plan to do. Thank you. Well, I want to start by thanking the judge for his great leadership and, of course, this team up here of elected officials. I can tell you that I'm very proud to be a part of this team and we look forward to working with our citizens. My priority right now is for the safety of our citizens and employees while still providing the services needed from the tax assessor collector's office to limit in-person visits for at least the next 30 days, property tax payment plans, I'm sorry, property tax payments and payment plan requests as well as vehicle registrations and vehicle title transfer requests will be accepted at our curbside drop-off. Also online, by phone, by mail, or in our 24-hour drop box. Additionally, the state has postponed due dates and some requirements for vehicle registrations and transfers. We have implemented some new procedures to limit physical contact, maintain social distance, and limit crowd size. So requests for property tax payment arrangements can now be made by email on our website or by phone or by regular mail. 
Additionally, I think it's important that uh, I note that we also have 20 private full service title companies located throughout Bear County that can conduct most motor vehicle transactions for an additional convenience fee. Uh, we have curbside drop off daily at three of our four locations from 8 a.m. to 9 a.m. and from 11 a.m. to 1 p.m. and we're probably going to increase those hours if, if, if things get worse. And as the judge mentioned, we have a new three-lane drive-through, which is pretty much state-of-the-art at our Southside Tax Office, and we encourage our citizens to use that. I understand that citizens are facing unexpected challenges right now, whether it's additional daycare costs or even the loss of jobs. We also understand that home evictions can be catastrophic at any time, but especially right now. The Tax Assessor Collector's Office wants to help our citizens through this difficult time. So I am therefore instructing the Linebarger Tax Attorney Law Firm to work with the Sheriff's Office and cancel all delinquent property tax foreclosure sales for the month of April and May. I'll also be getting with the Judge and the Sheriff and Commissioner's Court uh, later on and we're going to talk about, uh, where is the Sheriff, we're going to talk about uh, perhaps canceling the entire foreclosures uh, for for May and, and uh, for April and May, but we'll get we'll talk more about that as we go on. In closing, our mission is to help keep families in their homes, with an emphasis on helping our senior citizens, our disabled, our veterans, and ultimately our children. As part of this mission, the Bear County Tax Assessor Collector's Office has developed the most payment plans of any of the 254 counties in Texas including the only 10-month payment plan in the state. Finally, I want the citizens of Bear County to know that we are here to help. And I think that's very important for our citizens to know is that we are here to help. We understand what they're going through. We understand what they're feeling, as do all the leaders up here. And I also want them to know that together, we will work through the situation and, and evolve stronger and better as we overcome this challenge. Y para decirles en español, queremos que la gente sepan que nosotros estamos aquí para ayudarles a toda la gente. All right, lots of new information well, from tons. county leaders. Um, we'll wrap it up for you real quick and tell you what they said. First of all, uh, Judge Wolf said that they want to expand their emer emergency declaration for 30 days. Mm -hmm. They want also, to, oh, oh wait, he, he is, yeah, the county judge is speaking again. Let's, let's go back to uh, county judge. Uh, compliments. Uh, uh, the initial thing I put in there, and again, pending the approval of the commissioner's court, would reinstitute to not uh, uh, force renters in, 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 out, of, out, out of their homes. Uh, our, all of our justices of the peace are, are implementing that and are not uh, enforcing evictions, and we want to continue that effort also during this, uh, during this crisis. Uh, District Attorney uh, Joe Gonzalez has been instrumental in leading us on a lot of these different uh, initiatives and it, 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 his role as District Attorney includes also uh, the civil uh, uh, attorneys representing the Commissioner's Court. It's just been a tremendous, tremendous help. And he's taken a number of initiatives uh, to hold down our jail population. That's a dangerous place uh, for a number of reasons and uh, certainly the spread of this uh, uh, coronavirus, uh, COVID-19, is a danger in the jail. So, uh, District Attorney, would you like to come up and say a few words about policies you'll be implementing? Well, good morning, everyone, and thank you, Judge Wolf. Uh, I, too, would like to, to mention that I am honored to be in the presence of such great leaders in this, in this county. Um, I, I think it's important that the county know the steps that we're taking to protect everyone here. Some of you out in the public may be thinking, well, why do you have to have a press conference? Why not just do what you have to do and, 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 and not have this conference? It's important for us to communicate with you. It's important for us to tell you what steps we're taking. And certainly in our office, it's important to, to put the word out that we're adjusting the way we do business, but it, uh, it may affect what you do in our office in certain ways. So that's why we're doing this, is to educate the public about the steps that we're undertaking. Certainly, uh, our office is no different. We have what is essentially the largest law firm in, in Bear County, and so because of that, we have unique challenges. Uh, 
We have uh, a, a huge staff and some of those individuals have been identified as being high risk. And because of that, we have to look to see if there's ways that we can accommodate them. We're looking to see whether or not they can perhaps uh, work from home because while we're adjusting our manpower, the cases are still coming, right? Crime uh, still exists. We still have to review these cases. So that's what part of what we're doing is, is looking to see how we can modify the way we do business at the courthouse, the way we do business at the DA's office. And it's important to you that you know that because it's going to affect some members of the public. For example, when a criminal case is filed, uh, typically we in the DA's office have to reach out to victims of crime. We will continue to do that, but we're gonna ask that instead of you coming down and visiting with us in person, that we communicate telephonically, that we communicate electronically by text or email in order to avoid the person-to-person -person contact. Uh, additionally, uh, we, when we prepare for trial, uh, we have to um, contact witnesses. We're going to ask that the contact with the witnesses be kept to a minimum as well. So those are some of the, the, the types of changes that we're making to reduce the amount of person-to-person -person contact at the courthouse and in our office directly. Another group of individuals is the courthouse personnel. We've, we've had a tremendous partnership with the judges uh, who have been, been in communication with us. Some of, of the judges have decided to cancel their dockets for certain periods, for example, 30 days. Uh, on the misdemeanor level, some of the district judges are making deci decisions individually for their courts, and, and we're certainly working with them, but we're, we're all interested in keeping our community safe as, as possible. We're certainly interested in making sure that we can reduce the amount of people that have uh, direct contact with, with the courts. One of the things we're asking is, is, is to bear with us while we try and, and do our part to to look at the jail cases to, as Judge Wolf mentioned, reduce the jail population if we can. Again, we're never going to do anything that's gonna compromise the safety of Bear County, but I think we, we have to be concerned with the num number of people that are sitting at the Bear County Jail that are in confined spaces that cannot just walk out the front door. So we're gonna be looking to see whether or not we can impact that in any way. I wanna mention, for example, the last week or so, Travis County just up up the road on 35 have gotten together the judges there and identified a certain list of, of cases where they have uh, granted PR bonds. So we're certainly hopeful that the judges will do that uh, in this county. Speaking about uh, juries, we have grand juries that we have to continue to operate with. We've visited with, with them. They're a, a tremendous group of people that are dedicated and committed to making sure that we keep the criminal justice system going. They've already uh, told us that they're willing to continue to work, and so we're very honored and proud that we have those individuals that are willing to continue to do their part to serve the Bear County community. Again, I, 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 we're asking the people to just please bear, bear with us while we get through this, uh, and hopefully we can help impact uh, how we get affected with everything. One of the, the, the major concerns I will tell you that I have is um, the concern I have that we may see an increase in domestic violence because of the situation with coronavirus, people are gonna be um, you know, quarantined in their homes, they're gonna be limited to where they go, uh, there's going to be a lot of stress involved with, with this situation. People may be losing their jobs or, or it, it's impacting them some way. I want to tell those individuals that are victims of domestic violence that our Family Justice Center continues to be open, continues to operate. We're going to ask that instead of you coming per, in person to make the complaint and file the application, that you do it by phone. And I'm going to repeat, I'm going to mention the phone number. It is 210-630-1100. We'll continue to, to speak with you and take your uh, complaints, uh, uh, make the assessments, and do what we have to do. But again, we're trying to limit the direct contact. So again, thank you very much. Uh, and please bear with us, and we'll get through this together. Uh, <clears throat> Sheriff Salazar has uh, put in a number of uh, safeguards at the jail. We have somewhere usually between 3,800, maybe 4,200 people in that jail. They're all clustered in uh, a couple of buildings there. And so we, we're doing a number of enhanced uh, uh, measures to make sure that we do not um, 
allow this uh, disease to, to spread throughout the jail. So the show's taken a number of issues, and I'd like to ask him to come up and say a few words about what he's doing. A few words. Thank you, Judge. Good morning. Uh, you know, as first responders, we're used to dealing with bad guys and bullets. Uh, you throw a pandemic illness like uh, COVID-19 at us, and it, it's a game changer for certain. But I'm very proud of the way this agency has risen to the occasion and worked with all of our partners up here uh, to make sure that we're doing things as, as smoothly and as, as safely as we can, not just for the community, but for our first responders, of course, and for our inmate population. Uh, we have instituted our incident command uh, structure at the sheriff's office, and what that means is that, quite frankly, we've, we've uh, put up a, a substructure within our command staff headed up by Deputy Chief uh, Roland Schuler, who Chief Schuler is a, a, a veteran deputy with the Sheriff's Office. Of course, he's been here for, for around 30 years uh, with the Sheriff's Office. However, he's also a 20-year registered nurse. Uh, he speaks the lingo. And so he is our incident commander with, our, with regard to our response to, to uh, Corona. Um, we're instituting on a daily basis best practices that we're monitoring uh, and implementing from Department of Homeland Security, Centers for Disease Control, Texas Commission of Jail Standards, National Sheriff's Association, International Association of Chiefs of Police. We're taking all of those best practices and folding them into what we do, quite frankly. We're maintaining elements at the Bear County Jail, of course, uh, our courthouse, our substations, our training academy is still up and functional, uh, but we've also got elements at the EOC and, uh, and one of, at least one of the drive-through uh, testing facilities that we're providing security for. Uh, so what we're doing with regard to the law enforcement side of the house, we have implemented uh, what we call an enhanced um, uh, or alternate uh, level of, of response to patrol calls for service. And what we mean by that is basically we're lessening the type of calls that we're physically sending a deputy to. We're trying to handle as many calls for service by telephone and online as we possibly can to eliminate our, uh, our, our interactions with, with the community in order to continue to keep people safe. Also, we're, we're asking our deputies to not unnecessarily enter uh, houses or businesses, try to conduct uh, business from a safe distance and as, and as far outside as you possibly can. We're also tracking on a daily basis our jail metrics. Uh, everybody, everybody up here has mentioned thus far that we're trying to bring down our jail population uh, as safely as possible. You know, granted, there are people that just don't need to be walking amongst us, and for certain, those folks are going to be within the Bear County Jail. However, there is, there is, it's a, it's a pretty well-known fact. Judge, Judge uh, Wolf and I make it known that there are people in that jail that just don't belong. There's got to be other ways that we can, we can do things with folks like that. And so, those are the inmates that we're concentrating our efforts on, uh, getting them out on, on GPS monitoring, getting them out, time off for good behavior. Nonviolent misdemeanors is what we're concentrating our efforts on for today. Um, and, then, and then moving on from there. But we're looking at, at different ways of, of getting those folks back out into society. Um, you know, when, with, it, with jail populations, we serve a purpose. Jails absolutely serve a purpose in our society. However, in a situation like this involving a pandemic illness such as COVID-19, it, it's also a distinct possibility that jail can act as an incubator for this sickness and can, can act as an amplifier, as not only inmates are seeing their way back out into the community, but deputies are going home from their shift and going home to their families. Then those families, in turn, are going to daycare centers and, and places of employment. And so we're being very careful with how we screen inmates on their way in. Since last week, we set up our temporary command post there within the Sally Port where we've got our partners at UHS screening every inmate that comes into the facility, taking temperature, uh, asking, asking several questions that are, that are uh, designed to detect illness, and then diverting those people elsewhere. Uh, we've got a quarantine area set up that thankfully right now, knock on wood, that quarantine area is empty. Uh, we've only had to turn away, I believe, one inmate at this point that we had to send off to the hospital from, directly from that Sally Port. Uh, because of the way we're doing things. But additionally, um, we've, we're, we're testing inmates on their way out the door. Um, that may look like a medical procedure in some, in some instances, we're taking temperatures, but we're also asking them additional questions on their way out the door, again, to keep from acting as that amplifier uh, as they re-enter society. Um, we're also, uh, yesterday, have started now testing our deputies as they enter the facilities, uh, even our patrol substations, and here at the courthouse, we're looking at our future cast because we do expect that we could see a few thunderstorms as we get into tonight, and a few of those can make their way to San Antonio, much like what we saw this morning. So if you hear some rumbles of thunder overnight tonight, that'll be the reason why. And a lot of that will start to move out by Thursday morning, but we'll get some more chances for rain as we get into Friday and Saturday. Today, up around 81 about a 20% chance of rain this afternoon. 
and then a 60% chance tonight, 81 tomorrow, and then much cooler behind a cold front Friday, 57. More chances of rain Friday morning. We'll have some chances on Saturday, too, before it starts to warm back up as we get into next week. We're going to have much more coming up on KSAT News at noon. We'll be right back. Well, we will have much more. He's co Hi. completely right about that. <laughs> and we are going to take a quick break. We're monitoring the news conference. If we do need to cut in again, of course we will. Have a great morning. Live stream on our website, ksat.com. And, and we're still getting your commercial break ready so yeah. that we can go to that. So in the meantime, we can tell you one of the things that I got out of this was the county leaders announcing uh, local incentives and help for small businesses and for families, financial help, and interest-free loans and grants. County Judge Nelson Wolf and County Commissioner Justin Rodriguez say that they don't have to wait for state and federal resources. They're arranging loans and grants for small businesses. We're talking up to approximately $10,000 per business to cover things like payroll. And they say they've worked the math and might be able to cover up to 500 businesses here in Bear County. They're saying 200,000 in grants and they'll be four and um, for the loans themselves, five million interest-free loans with four month grace periods to make your payments. Uh, partnering also to create a disaster response fund for families, tax assessor's office working on holding off on evictions of foreclosures, but we're gonna have a complete wrap up. There's a, a lot of information, lot of information here. Yeah. You can find it on our website and of course on our later newscasts. We'll be back.